Right, welcome everybody. I'll be talking about whether AI will be smarter than you in your lifetime. So first I'll be talking about why address the issue of human level intelligence. I'll be defining what an intelligence explosion is and talk about uh, AI impacts and why we should be concerned about AI issues, measuring the progress in AI, AI versus artificial general intelligence. And I'll define that term later. But um, AI boosters that will increase the likelihood of AI being smarter than human level intelligence, which I'll abbreviate as HLI, expert opinions on timelines, because there's many experts out there. Why do so many experts disagree? And also the long-term future of humanity. So yeah, there'll be uh, there's a conference in planning, and that's going to be focusing on philosophy, epistemology, and human understanding, which helps really identify some of the needful aspects of cognition that are desirable for building uh, um, an intelligence in the future. So why should we really address this issue? Why should we address the issue of AI surpassing human level intelligence? How should we really think about this solution? It's it's nice to think about these sorts of things because it really motivates us to uh, take us outside our own comfort zones and, and think outside the box. So intelligence is powerful. It's a major reason, if not the major reason, why we rose to prominence within the animal kingdom and are surrounding ourselves every day with increasingly capable technology. If relatively high intelligence were not a defining characteristic of us humans, uh, we would not be here to discuss this, especially over the technology of the internet and Zoom. So if we solve intelligence, we solve a whole lot of other problems that require intelligence to solve them. If you think carefully, there are a lot of those. One of them includes climate change. I'll argue that superintelligence will, more likely than not, appear this century, even if the progress rate to date does not strongly suggest it happening within this decade. Okay, so intelligence is powerful and potentially dangerous. It's easy to underestimate the optimization power of intelligence. We're born surrounded by technology. We wake up every day surrounded by technology. It seems ordinary. Most of us are the products of intelligence we take for granted. Thinking outside of our comfort zones, what do you think it would have been like to be born 100,000 years ago and, and, and walk around the place? There was no, hardly any technology, maybe some language, maybe some rudimentary tools like a, like a hand axe. And we can see that today, look, we've, we've gone from hand axes to sniper rifles to fully automated drones. I mean, this, these things just didn't grow on trees. We, we developed these, we innovated, we used our intelligence to uh, go from barefoot meandering to heavier than air flight. Uh, now we have robots on Mars and, and footprints on the moon. So if intelligence has taken us very far, we should think about force multipliers. Compare a bunch of people with abacuses to one person with a modern day laptop in Excel. Force multipliers leverage gains in artificial intelligence too. I mean, better tools like brain scanners give us a clear view on what brains are doing inside our skulls. A faster hardware platform allows us for faster running of algorithms and exotic computation like quantum computation, GPU technology. Look, there's even graph processing units, which should be um, of interest to Andrew, that are coming online. I I'd say that they'll be pretty big at least halfway through the coming decade. That is, the, maybe by 2025 beforehand. Improved algorithms for speed and quality of output. And also there's progress in philosophy. And I think that's also a force multiplier too, because it helps us ask better questions and design better research programs. So we can see that evolution got us this far as in terms of like it, it evolved our brain. Uh, it gave us the natural ability to think. It produced humans, but over very long time scales. This doesn't mean it'll take a similar amount of time to develop AI. Evolution is slow. Technological development, in contrast, is very fast. We as intelligence designers collaborate with our constructed systems, which work like force multipliers, by the way. This is kind of like a new signature, a far more efficient way of achieving our goals, such as AI, achieving intelligence. So, got a bunch of syllogisms. Uh, I, I take reference from Claus, who introduced one of last week. These ones are created, I, I think they're probably not foolproof, but anyway, here we go. So like human extinction, humans have required technological progress until the machine sufficiently automate technological progress. Now, the question is, when will this happen? I'm not answering that in these syllogisms here. First one, each syllogism pods on each other. Intelligence is powerful. Um, AI is intelligence. Therefore, AI is powerful. 
syllogism too. Technological progress is it's a much faster force multiplier than evolutionary progress. AI is subject to technological progress and HI, human level, that's human intelligence, is subject to evolutionary progress. Therefore, AI will become smarter, faster than human intelligence. Three, more intelligence is more powerful than less intelligence. AI will overtake HI. Therefore, AI will be more intelligent than human intelligence. Uh, and again, I stress the big question is when, and that's really hard to answer because nobody has a crystal ball. One of the defining characteristics of the goals of AI is achieving the intelligence explosion. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. Now, a seminal statement made by Irving J. Good, British mathematician, worked with Alan Turing at Bletchley Park. Even after the Second World War continued on with him, Turing, uh, doing Bayesian statistics. So the quotation is important. I'm going to try and emphasize the important bits. So let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that faster, can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. That should be any person, however clever, by the way. Since the design of such machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could be able to design even better machines. There would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of people would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that we need make. So... Let's talk about what that means. So the purest case is AI writing its own source code. Uh, force multipliers, discoveries in multiple areas of science and technology are increasing the likelihood of all sorts of conditions for an intelligence explosion to occur. The intelligence explosion would have profound effect on all of us. So tipping points. This is Sisyphus sitting there like on a nice chair while he, his robot pushes the rock up the hill every day. So all we need to do is design a robot to push the rock up the hill. Problem solves, checkmate. Okay, that's it. And we've solved uh, the problem. Maybe the robot could turn the, the rock into a bunch of nanobots and then it could create a, a new profound massage chair for him to sit in all day. All right, David Chalmers, who's, who's ever heard of him? He's a, an Australian philosopher. So what happens when machines become smarter than us? The key idea is that machine intelligence that is more intelligent than humans will be far better than humans at designing these machines. And so we can see this feedback loop. So it will be capable of designing machine more intelligent than the most intelligent machine that humans can design. I hope that makes sense. So keep this in mind, and this is very important, as I'll discuss later, DeepMind did program AlphaGo to learn the narrow domain of playing Go from scratch. It developed a model in which defeated all the AI programs developed to play Go in the past. So all the programs that humans have specifically programmed to play Go, this AI, this DeepMind algorithm, learnt how to play from tabula rasa from scratch and beat them all. So David Chalmers does believe that AI greater than HLI, human level intelligence, is not only out of the question but likely, and that the main obstacles are likely to be obstacles of motivation rather than obstacles of capacity. Werner Vengi is a seminal science fiction writer who coined the term the technological singularity so do we have the means to create super intelligence now? Within 30 years, he said, in 1994, so we've only got four more years to go, okay? Now, I don't know if we can expect it with another four years, but it's, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but I'd say it's unlikely. Closing the positive feedback loop. Well, here we have, like, just a, um, a diagram which explains this. A positive feedback loop is completed through an agent's ability to in intelligently design and recreate its ability to intelligently redesign and recreate itself. Moore's Law. Um, okay, so this is often brought up as being something that, like, just people believe. It's well known. In, in economic terms, it's an argument for growth in computational power, which is an enabler for growth in AI. So let me ask fundamentally, what's the primary cause of the force producing Moore's law? Any answers? What is it? Well, I mean, fundamentally, it's human intelligence. I mean, we created the technology that enabled this to happen. It didn't happen just out of the blue. I'd add that human intelligence is complemented by the technologies that humans create. And technology as a force multiplier for human intelligence plus AI is a mixed intelligence. Remember last week I spoke about distributed cognition in the lecture about post-humanism. Okay, so 
why should we be concerned? Well, there's a couple of things. We need the AI to align to our values or values that, that, are, that are useful. Um, we as humans may not have good values. Maybe we want AI to teach us better values. And also race conditions. That's a concern because it's um, obviously the first company or person to develop AI as well will have such a first move of advantage Hugo de Garris coined a lot of terms. He, he, he believes that there will be a lot of sociological problems. He believes that ideological disagreements between two, of the, two groups, humans who want to remain human and cosmos who want to merge with the AI, will be an issue that is so strong it will uh, incite a war. So will HLI rise at the same pace with AI? Will humans' intelligence rise with AI? Well, natural human intelligence is bound by our skull size and, and the biological bottlenecks of our wetware. And so, no, I don't think it will. We can't have instant scaling applied through the cloud like AI can. We can't sort of merge seamlessly with machines. That may happen sometime in the future, but then will it be human? <laughs> we can try merging and go post-human, but it's kind of like the old software is kept alive by attaching appendages to an old kernel. Imagine we did never uh, developed any more new operating systems since Windows 95, and we kept the Windows 95 kernel and just built add-ons to improve it. Well, yeah, that wouldn't work. Okay, so Ben Gersel, many of you may have heard of him if you've been following the AGI literature. Hugely influential in the AGI community. I will be interviewing him tomorrow on AGI, uh, a sort of, I guess, language modeling thing called GPT-3. And what's missing in that approach? And I'll be talking with him about symbol grounding, etc. So how are we to think about the problem of whether we'll be able to make a progress uh, in AI this century, whether we'll achieve AI which is unambiguously smarter than human-level intelligence. So I've already spoken about feedback loops, but I want you to proceed with caution. Need to encourage personal epistemic humility. The contention of the debate is catchy and provocative. Uh, it's silly to think, though, that we can know for sure one way or the other with certainty about things that haven't happened yet, like whether we will actually achieve smarter than human level AI. Look, some expert speakers are 100% certain sometimes, but actually I think they're just signaling. But we can't be absolutely confident in AI, and nor should we. We just don't know when for sure. We, we, we don't have the evidence. We do know that AI has surpassed human-level intelligence in, in certain areas, and I'll talk about that later, like in narrow domains. The debate title says, in your lifetime. What does that mean? Whose lifetime? I mean, I can imagine there's some 20-year-olds in the audience or 25-year-olds, so here it is. If you're 25, 20 to 25, the average lifetime in Australia today is about 85. Some of you will live to 100 naturally, I'm sure. So let's just add 60 to the current year, and that gets us to 2080. So if we assume progress in medicine, lifetimes on average will also go up, as they already have been. So we could comfortably squeeze another 20 years. So let's just say cut off date by 2100, the end of the century, a nice even number, even though I do believe that people could live a lot longer than that given the right medical advances so if you're comfortable with probability estimates um, recapping the last section addressing why why then ask will ai surpass human level intelligence if you also grant as i've suggested that intelligence is powerful and that you also grant that there is a non-negligible chance of um, human level ai or beyond by 2100 this issue is important super important i think it I think that's really the spirit of this debate, not sort of debating whether it, it, you know, we should treat the question as an on-off switch. So uh, there are many uh, ways to achieve flight, some more reliable than others. Likewise, there are many ways to achieve intelligence. There's no single path to achieving superintelligence. Stuart Russell once said that aeronautical engineering techs do not define the goal of their field as making machines that fly so exactly like pigeons that they fool even other pigeons. So we should be careful of putting too much stock in the single path dependency. We should really see things like, you know, a, a Gantt chart or a PERT chart with multiple pathways to AI. So is in human intelligence the only form of intelligence? 
I don't think so. It's Is it the apex of all possible intelligence? No. Human level intelligence is one point in the space of all possible minds as a goal to reach. So AI is intelligent in different ways than humans, kind of alien in a sort of sense. So we can see this is a this area is a blow up of this particular section here. So intelligence is not a single dimension. It's sim- it just makes it really hard and really difficult to measure exact estimates of human level intelligence. So the question is whether a machine will be smarter than you is like asking asking for a high level simple answer. Though part of the exercise in this is really realizing this problem, I guess. Uh, the human level intelligence term has problems. The idea of using levels to define intelligence is simplistic, and so we should... It's just sort of fine if you're comparing within species, if you're just comparing humans to humans, but perhaps it's more appropriate to classify it as human-situated intelligence if you're making up comparisons between uh, differentially abled intelligences. For the sake of parsimony, I'll be abbreviating, as I said before, HLI um, as human intelligence, AI as artificial intelligence. Even though I think like the term artificial has its problems, it comes from the word artifice, and you know, um, intelligence isn't necessarily a tool. So there are conceptual spaces and the possibility um, in the spaces of possible minds that help us see beyond our anthropocentric biases. I mentioned this last week. AI could inhabit human and non-human spaces. The idea of comparing differently capable minds uh, that sit differently in places in the space of possible minds. Uh, so you could argue that to some degree that these minds aren't ideally commensurable. So it's hard really to compare them. But if you try to take objective measurements like capability gains, that could help. If an AI develops nanotech and disassembles our moon, reassembles its atoms into some hyperdimensional gateway and begins to communicate with some post-singularity beings across the universe or whatnot, and we are sitting around playing Angry Birds in Fortnite, we may claim that we are more intelligent or that we are the apex species or that we have dignity or that we're special, but reality doesn't care what we claim. We are still at the mercy of its constraints and affordances and we are still just a bunch of self-entitled meatbags fantasizing of how special we are. But if AI capability just like races past our capability, look, we're going to be in a very tenuous position for sure. Next. So not saying that we are not special, though we shouldn't let it cloud our judgment. Here are a couple of examples of non-human animals in um, inhabiting different spaces in the space of possible intelligences or possible minds. The Portia fimbriata is, is like a, a, a fringe jumping spider, can learn the behavior of other spiders so as to most effectively sneak up on it. It's an excellent hunter. This is a mimic octopus. You should really Google this. It can change its shape and color in very strange but exciting ways. And a coconut octopus, which is great at using tools, shells or even coconut that have been sliced in half by humans and turns in little houses for protection. Strange but fascinating. Cephalopods are arachnids are entirely like us. Major phylogenetic branch, completely different from ours. Uh, the earliest branch, I believe, came from... Uh, the Nephronosa. Uh, that's uh, 560 million years ago. Uh, this group split into proteasomes. Uh, some argue that the last common ancestor was with the octopus and humans was some kind of worm with life-sensitive eyeballs, eye, or just spots really, that lived about 750 million years ago. Interestingly, um, cephalopods are also like uh, share with vertebrates. Uh, a number of convergent adaptations. They have a closed circulatory system, vertebrate-like eyes, highly developed brain, though their brains are very different. Um, you know, their brains are sort of distributed throughout their body, uh, including their legs, um, and sort of infused with their nervous system, which is kind of strange. Our brain, on by contrast, is far more centralized. Uh, so it seems like we, we are closely related to the octopi, but actually we are not. Um, so, yeah, we're differently situated intelligences. Some convergences in function. So, yeah, d- recall what I was talking about in many ways to achieve flight, the function of flight. So it's likewise the same with intelligence. So evolution built a variety of minds. Perhaps the closest we can get to meeting an alien intelligence will be something like one of these or a spider. I hope we get to see, like, extraterrestrials, so that'll be fun. 
Talking about extraterrestrials, has anybody ever read Solaris by Stanislaw Lem? The idea of an alien intelligence is like that of Solaris could, could be compared to human intelligence is exciting, but how do you do it? How do you compare your mind to an alien mind? Should one judge the alien intelligence by human standards? Are they incommensurable or is there some common terms on which to measure them, like capability? So the synopsis of this film is that a, a psychologist guy, um, there are two films actually and a book, is that the, a psychologist is among a crew and they sent a spaceship to investigate this sort of water world. Uh, there's an unknown phenomenon and, uh, emanating from it and so there is a strange in- intelligence distributed across its oceans and atmosphere that creates replicas of humans, deep fakes in a sense, to interact with the crew and including the psychologist's dead romantic interest. Look, it gets weird, but it's fun. Uh, intelligence is powerful. Uh, it's important to evaluate when and where the, the progress has been made. Intelligence is an abstract concept. I don't think we should just use human intelligence as the gold standard for intelligence in general. We should take a wide view of intelligence. Uh, we, we need to not be blindsided in AI capability. Doing things are highly impactful and cognitive, and just because we choose not to label as intelligence doesn't mean it won't have impact. So over there, like an AI in the future, maybe creating a diathlon swarm or creating a longevity pill or playing war games, it's not benign because it doesn't fit under the label that we choose to give it. If we fail to give it a label of intelligence, it may be, in fact, very capable anyway. So what are the salient aspects of artificial intelligence that we should focus on? What problems are being worked on to achieve AGI now? So artificial general intelligence is AI that can perform a generally intelligent action across domain. In other words, cross-domain optimizations. So AGI doesn't um, imply optimal intelligence. Ideally, general intelligence is a misconception. And by the way, humans are not optimally general either. So we really should be thinking about gradients. There's this sort of ideal general intelligence over here. I really should say ideal intelligence instead of AGI at the uh, the very right of this spectrum. Um, and w- humans, I guess, are somewhere in between. Current state of AI is also somewhere in between. So there is a gradient between finely narrow AI and fully blown ideal intelligence. I think like in, in, in concept, there could be a, like an ideal artificial general intelligence. It's just so I don't think it'll be computable. So two key things to solve to get towards artificial general intelligence is unsupervised learning. That's learning without human direction uh, there's unla- with unlabeled data. And we can say that DeepMind's AlphaGo and AlphaStar sort of do this. When, when they learn from tabula rasa um, in, a, in a sense and also transfer learning that is knowledge from one domain are being applied to another and also few or one shot learnings uh, GTP3 which I'm going to be talking about later um, and language modeling engine has already done this and so yeah this is going to be fun this legend is the CEO of DeepMind uh, GTP was developed by OpenAI that was founded by Elon Musk so knowledge in, knowledge in one domain uh, uh, being applied to other. We've got some examples in Parler. Um, yeah, most algorithms, what is uh, transfer learning, by the way? Most algorithms trained in one domain can't use what's being learned from another domain. A big hope for AI is to have systems that take insights from one domain setting and apply them elsewhere. Um, and so DeepMind's in Parler simultaneously performs multiple tasks uh, in this case, playing seven, uh, like 57 Atari games, and then it shares info between them. And doing this has shown performance increases. Also, Regal does this too. Both deep mind things. Okay, so how do we measure progress in AI? Well, cognitive modeling, that is simply thinking and learning similar to humans, comparing AI versus human reaction times, error rates, response quality, we can use these as things to sort of measure human versus machine intelligence. So we've got some evaluation metrics that we could use, concrete models, uh, metrics like performance and scalability, also fault tolerance, and that is, uh, does it degrade gracefully or fail catastrophically? Humans um, degrade gracefully, but sometimes fail. 
Uh, and so, look, abstract measures, task and domain generality, uh, expressivity, robustness, instructability, taskability, explainability. I won't go to, into these in too much detail. Um, you can Google them. So a full understanding of the human intelligence is not required for AI. It's certainly not. I mean, it would be great if we had a full understanding, but we haven't needed full understandings to um, use fire. Remember the old phlogiston theory? We still were, were utilizing fire. And way before we had phlogiston theory, you know, we were harnessing fire about at least 1.7 million years ago. So how long ago did we actually have a scientific understanding of how fire worked? Not that long ago. So at the moment, we have an, in, an incomplete understanding of biology, though still we have drugs and medicine that work. Since we have many engineering successes in areas that we don't fully understand, why do we need to fully understand the brain before we can build intelligences? I think that's a misconception that we do. Of course, a full understanding would help, but it's not required to make progress. This, uh, this is, so we have peaks of AI cognitive capacity, which far exceed human capacity. We also have valleys in AI capacity, which are far below human peak capacities. So, um, yeah, measuring intelligences versus like an, an AI versus in the human intelligence can't be done on a singular axis. I think what we're seeing is a rising tide in general AI cognitive capability or across the board AI co cognitive capability, some slower than others. But will the valleys in AI cognitive capacity rise above the peaks in human cognitive capacity? I'd argue yes. So here, this is really meant to be um, an illustration, not an accurate representation. So you can see here we got human capacities and that, like we're good at some things, excellent at others and okay at other things and also bad, very bad at other things. And the same with AI. But in the future, we can imagine the AI cognitive capacities rising to meet human capacities or even in some cases overtaking them. Um, and so will all of AI cognitive capacities exceed human cognitive capacities in the future, or at least all of the ones that are the useful economically? So we can look at other ways to evaluate whether AI is going to reach human level intelligence or beyond. And one's in trend extrapolation. That's a, that's a black box. You're not really looking at behind the scenes what's going on to a great degree. You're just observing general behaviors. And that's Or an inside view, um, that's a white box or translucent box view uh, where you've got a weak inside view. Like a weak inside view is visualizing what the causal processes are doing. That is to produce loose qualitative conclusions about only those issues where there seems to be lopsided support for progress in AI. And where we can do this, we should trust these particular weak inside views over the surface level trend extrapolations. Where these weak inside views drill down to a deeper causal level and the balance of support is sufficiently lopsided to justify saying, well, there's AI progress in area X. So um, required milestones for progress in AI might just rest on features of unexplored solution space, which we can't guess in advance. So we really should try to understand what the solution space really is. Yep. An example of trend extrapolation is the internet. So ARPANET went from 20 to, sorry, 10 to 20 K uh, people in a year or nodes in a year. Then at 10 years later, it was a, a million nodes. Now it's 40 to 80 million. And the curve looks the same from 10 to 20K to 40 to 80 million. But there's a big difference between 10 to 20K and 40 to 80 million. So how many devices do you think are connected to the internet today? I just want just take a guess in your own mind. A report by Strategy Analytics say that 22 billion devices connected to the internet in 2018 also that there's going to be about 38.6 billion devices in 2025 and maybe 50 billion devices in 2030. Now, the Earth's population is currently 7.8 billion. That's 2.8 devices now, roundabout, and by 2030, that's 6.4 devices for every person. Not to say that each person will own 6.8 devices. That might include all sorts of 
Internet of Things devices. Look, we've had all sorts of growth in not just CPU technology, but also hard drive and RAM are getting much bigger and faster and GPUs are getting bigger and faster. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll have graph processing units, which will be excellent at running cognitive computing a lot faster. So I recently bought a two terabyte solid state drive for around $300, mainly because I need it to do video editing and stuff. An example of exponential growth. This is what it looks like. I should say that we don't need unlimited hardware to run AI. So the stronger the AI in the future, no need for universal computers. That's a misconception. It's absolutely not required for superintelligence in any way, shape or form. More computing power, bring it on and it's going to happen. We're going to have more computing power and differently abled computers. So, but we don't just don't need universal computers. I think it's ridiculous to think that we do need that. I mean, human brains don't have that. Why should we expect computers to need that? So trend extrapolation, I've got my biases against solely using trend extrapolation to sort of predict the future. As I said before, it's useful also to try and look at the causal factors under, underneath the hood and gather some sort of yeah, weak inside view of what's going on to make sense of where things are going in the future. So let's talk about timelines. And this is an example of a timeline. You can see by 2080... Kurzweil suggests that AI will be smarter than all human brains. Whether you believe that or not, that's what he thinks. That's that's what he extrapolates. But what do the experts, what do a variety of experts say? So it's important not to just take one expert opinion. We should really be taking opinions from a variety of experts. And so what we see is we have a number of polls, three years for the championship on Angry Birds, four years till, and this was in 2016, four years to World Series Poker, six years to StarCraft, six years for Fontaine Laundry, yeah, yada, 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 11 years to expert songwriting. Now, I believe some of these were actually achieved earlier. World Series Poker, Angry Birds, StarCraft is already superhuman. It's at Grandmaster level. Songwriting, yes, they've already created songs that are indistinguishable from humans and there's been tests on this from human writing there's been other surveys suggesting 2050 uh, an agi poll was done where a series of, like of experts converged around 2050 in 2017 ai experts were saying that 50 percent chance of agi before 2060 that doesn't mean at 2060 it meant sometime before 2060 and all jobs to be automated, jobs like call center reps and truck, truck driving and retail sales by 2030. And further, and this is not the largest data set, but it's still pretty cool. AI experts participated in a survey uh, on when the singularity occur. Now, the singularity is not a synonym for AGI. A singularity may occur way beyond AGI. So 45% of respondents predicted a date to be around uh, 2060, and that was the majority there. Only 34% of the participants would, uh, predicted a date of, 20, of after 2060, and 21% said never. But this is talking about the singularity, not about AGI. But AGI should be required for the singularity, so you can say that it could happen before. Uh, there's been a couple of tests out there that people know about. The well-known one is Turing test, and that's arguably been passed before, but by cunning chatbot programmers. Uh, an unsophisticated chatbot program called Eugene U Gooseman passed the Turing test a few years ago. But Winograd schemas, I think a lot more reliable. They are thought to be have been passed, uh, close to passing anyway. So the lions of natural language processing would be impressed at scores of Winograd schema challenges that reach over 90%. And the news flash is earlier this year, generative language model GPT-3 achieved a score of 88.3. That's 0.7 away from the 90% that, okay, we're allowed to be impressed now threshold. Yeah, and this is without specific fine tuning. And this was done earlier this year. So what can we say AIs won't be capable of doing within the next 50 years? I don't know what the best predictions are, but Hubert Traceface has been a long-term detractor, uh, AI detractor in some cases. He was wrong. Um, often, like, you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, if an AI can do it, then it's not really intelligence. It's not, yeah. But that's 
a bias. That's that's a fallacy. That's a, the no true Scotsman fallacy right there. Just because an AI wins at chess doesn't mean that it's not real intelligence or it doesn't require real intelligence to do so. AI has done all sorts of things like writing poetry, making funny jokes. And these jokes and poetry have been sort of mixed up with human jokes and poetry and given to humans. Humans can't tell the difference which ones were generated by AI and which ones were generated by humans. And so formulative strategies have been created. AlphaGo creates strategies to defeat opponents. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about AlphaGo. It's uh, an AI that was created by DeepMind that defeated the grand champion at the age-old game of Go. And Alpha Star, which was great at playing the, the computer game StarCraft II, and that was more of a 3D environment. So, um, yeah, that was arguably more impressive. So, yeah, intelligence is powerful. Human intelligence is a small fraction of the large space of possible minds. We already have smarter than human-level AI in narrow domains, AI that could self-improve would become very powerful very fast. The consensus for AI reaching human level is around 2050 or 2060, according to a variety of expert polls across a variety of experts. Okay, so feasibility. What will hasten the arrival of AI? Okay, so we look at this overhang. We've got algorithmic performance gains so overhang is, yeah, could result from a number of things. Performance gains in algorithms, economic gains, or even cheaper cloud infrastructure. Also self-improving systems. So we've seen economic gains. In 2016, AI investment rose three times to $39 billion since 2013. What is it recently? Guess. $70 billion, apparently. I haven't got the slide for that. It's in another one. Oh, God, I'm using old presentation. Yeah, so yeah, there is 70 billion. That's now. Um, and I guess the main point about this slide is between 2010 and 2019, the total number of AI papers on you know a, a popular open source publishing platform has increased 20 times since 2010 and 2019. That's a lot. So hardware overhang refers to a situation where large quantities of computing hardware can be diverted to run more powerful AI systems as soon as the hardware is developed. In the context of AI forecasting, a hardware overhang is a situation where enough computing power, computing hardware to run many powerful AI systems already exist by the time the software to run such systems is developed. So if hardware is repurposed to AI at that stage, it would mean that as soon as powerful AI systems exist in software form, they could be duplicated because AI um, as a piece of software can, can be copied. This might amplify the impact of the arrival of human level AI or beyond. And the reverse is true. If it's incredibly greedy, then we might have only have one system that is superhuman, but it would be act more like a, a singleton then. Okay, so let's look at the kinetics of an intelligence explosion. So what we got here is, this is us now, we've got this system capability axis and this time uh, axis. And this is interesting to sort of help understand what, what it might look like, uh, what progress might look like. And this is not meant to be um, an exact graph. And AI is not meant to be taken as something that will just be increasing in capability forever. And so there won't be in infinite increasings upwards, I don't believe. Uh, to think so is a misconception. It's a misconception that serious thinkers believe that. Now, in the graph, it tells a story. And we have machine intelligences passing human baseline. That's this. And then after so at some point, it's a crossover. And so this is when AI can self-improve. And then it'll get to more capable than, uh, I guess, the all possible humans that exist in the civilization. And then after that, it'll just keep them going perhaps and, and become super intelligent beyond civilization by far. And after that, it should sort of asymptote at some stage progress in capability. So there's all sorts of experts that come out and said, hey, we should be concerned. Bill Gates is one of them. He says that reverse engineering the brain is in reach and also believes that there's reasons why you should be concerned about it happening. Stuart Russell, as I said before, who um, was a seminal author of the textbook AI, A Modern Approach, 
arguably, uh, probably uh, people say is probably one of the most trustworthy sources out there. He thinks that AI is a concern that we should be really thinking about it now rather than later. He doesn't think that it, it's going to happen never. He, he, he thinks that it's likely to happen this century. If human beings are losing every time, it doesn't really matter whether they're losing to a conscious machine or a completely non-conscious machine. They still lost. And so the singularity is about a quality of decision making, which is not necessarily conscious at all. And there's been experts' predictions of never in the past. So some examples of progress. I'm going to just rush through these. Tic-tac-toe, optimal, um, Rubik's Cube, checkers, yada, yada. Othello, Scrabble, backgammon. These are all superhuman, Jeopardy, uh, Go, subhuman or high human. StarCraft 2 may have actually escalated to superhuman by now since I wrote these slides. So I, I need to take note there. Yeah, I've spoken about AlphaGo and AlphaStar. Uh, they went from blank slates, these algorithms. They weren't um, given the instructions or taught. They were just blank slates that learnt from a stream of pixels coming from like a like a video of a Go board of someone playing and, and then learnt how to play uh, Go very quickly and became better at playing Go than any purpose-built AI program by humans was able to become and it is of course it beat all the grandmasters and all that and so the same can be said for chess there's no program that people can purposefully build that can beat that, that that an ai can learn from scratch yeah it's sort of that's important i mean the idea that ai can program itself better than we can program an ai is in in, in narrow domains at least is alarming yeah G gpt2 which was interesting. Now we've got GPT-3 this year. Last year I spoke about GPT-2, which is a language model, which is continuously impressing people. It's certainly got a lot of media attention. That's it. That's it in a nutshell. Intelligence is powerful. We already have AI that's smarter than human level intelligence. Uh, too many examples of these sort of limited domains exist. But I'd say that some of these are on the spectrum between AI and AGI. We should be concerned because we want to preserve the long-term future of the human species. And I spoke about this last week. So there we go. That's it. Do you want to see a demo of GPT-3? Um, why don't we just give the, the, why don't we just give the, the, the site? I, I actually visited it sure. today. It's oh, cool. of, um, it generates a, a philosophical, <laughs> it generates philosophical responses to questions that you put in it. Uh, so Adam has actually put in, when will AI outsmart humans and received uh, uh, what well, competing responses, much like this debate, mm -hmm. with some saying, yes, this will happen in our lifetime, uh, and one uh, indicating, at least one indicating that it won't happen in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a very uh, interesting um, exercise. Uh, so um, there was a lot of information, uh, Adam, thank you for that.